Continuing our reading in Hellbent for Election by Phyllis Bisek, Chapter 20. The sidewalks were drying now, and the air was hot and muggy. The children peeled off their light sweaters, and a man going down the street carried his suitcase over his arm and went about loosening his collar. It will rain again this afternoon, I said. Yes, Alexis nodded. We came to a cement block building with a stucco front, and Alexis paused and admired it for a moment. I believe you attended this church for a while. Uh, off and on, that is, I, I always attended some church, but I didn't usually actually join any. Uh, first, because of the way we grew up. Second, because I had made the promise to Della. Third, because of the inconsistencies between believers' behavior and the guidebook, as I have told you. I see. And yet you did not always live according to the guidebook, Hellbent. No. But during those ten years of being a professed believer, I certainly tried. Besides, Alexis, I have no grudge against a sincerely mistaken believer, nor against any believer who honestly seeks to know his will and to do it. For instance, there was a presence in the outer office of the high registrar named Complete Trust, I could have lived compatibility compatibly with them um, and delightfully with his kind. And there were a few of them, but a uh, very few in comparison to the ones who bent on distorting him and the guidebook to suit their own purposes and then insisting that their way is the right way and everyone else is in error. Of course, there is one thing you have not understood, Hellbent. And that is the immensity of the upper abode. Speaking in time terms, it would be quite possible for you to exist for years without ever running across one of whom you had a particularly chafing relationship. On the other hand, if you were waiting for someone in particular to arrive, you could seek him out without much ado. Now, that may well be. However, you must agree that humans are, by and large, pretty much the same the world over. That is, they fall into categories of behavior. So while I might not meet an individual I had actually known, I could still be expected to be exposed to his general type almost incessantly, which would be equally as bad as the individual. Alexis shook his head and sighed. Oh, you are a stubborn and persistent one in your conviction that there is no such thing as perfect happiness. Tell me this. How could perfect happiness be perfect happiness if we permitted unhappiness to exist therein? That's just what I have been telling you. Do you make him out a liar then? I make him out the opposite. Either he has given us free will or he has not. According to the guidebook, he has. But if he revokes it, when we discard our temporal husk and move above to dwell in his immediate presence, then it was not a gift at all, but a loan. I cannot believe this could happen. For if he had wanted legions of robots, he could have created them. Instead, he created beings who could become his children, as you have said, Alexis, by choice. And if we have made the choices which places us in his immediate presence, why should he then remove the choice mechanism, and force us to become chattel. No, it cannot be that way. Since he abolished death for the upper abode, must an extension and enlargement of a kind of life already established on earth when we believe and accept him? For even as a human, I was in him and he in me. This condition can only grow and wax greater and stronger when we go above. He will not make slaves of us, Oh, very well, said Alexis. Have it your way, and let us go on. Tell me how you came to attend this church. As we walked slowly on down the street, I said, uh, In obedience to the guidebook, I, I knew I must attend, and since I vowed not to attend either of the churches of my parents' relatives, it was necessary to fellowship and worship elsewhere. This seemed like um, as good a beginning as any since they professed to live by his standards. And did they? If I had a face, I would have grinned. Uh, yes and no, I said. 
That is, they made a stab at it now and again, but perpetually recoiled with wailing and moaning. They were a niggardly bunch. I, I remember one man in particular, uh, even Swap was his name, who took one try at tithing. Oh, it was long before I started to attend their church. But to hear him tell it, you would have thought it happened yesterday. It was, in fact, his favorite dirge. I tithed for six months, he used to mourn. I was never rewarded. On the contrary, my wife got sick, my car broke down, the creek went dry, my horse died, and the barn caught fire. Alexis snickered. I suppose you handed him a handkerchief. Well, no, as a matter of fact, at first, armed with brotherly love, I tried to be patient and understanding and sympathetic. But after I've heard the lament six or eight times, I attempted to offer the explanation that we are not to expect monetary rewards, necessarily, and that if it were not for him, there would be no wife, no car, no creek, no horse, no barn to begin with. But he was not the only one, Alexis. That church was full of them. There was Mrs. Parsimonious, for example. Her main grievance was the way the shepherd lived. He drives a better car than we do, she would say resentfully. His house has been redecorated more recently than ours. But did they not provide the shepherd with his house? Oh, of course. The parsonage was church property, so to speak. And did they not recognize that he might have had a, a better working budget? My no. Miss Parsimonious and her elite little group always concluded that the shepherd was drawing too large a salary and that tithing was strictly Old Testament. What do you think about it yourself, Hellbent? I thought mainly that all we have and that all we are belongs to him anyway. So there was not much point in setting up a fence at 10%. His selected people were told not to murder, for example, but he said himself that we are not even to be in anger. Likewise, his selected people were told not to commit adultery. But he said in person that to look upon a woman lustfully was wrong. Applying the same ratio of comparisons to the strictly Old Testament instruction to tithe, it's easy to see that the guidebook was not carrying much authority. It is also easy to see that I was not looked upon favorably for my interpretation. Dear, dear, but surely some of the members did not begrudge him. Very few, Alexis. Oh, there were some who tithed to the very fraction of a cent, as a matter of fact. And then they promptly made this fact known and attempted to set the pace for everyone else. One such example was named Limelight. Perfection, he would declare, is best encouraged by performance. If we can see it in others, what we ourselves ought to be, we can make the change more readily. Now I believe in obedience to the very letter, and this is the way I figure my family's finances. Uh, part of a cyclone, murmured Alexis. Did he fail to realize that his idea of perfection might not be true perfection at all? Or that where he stressed obedience to the letter in one area... He might fall far short in another. Humans never see themselves as others see them, Alexis. You know that. Besides, he was not really concerned with perfection, only with putting on a show and using him as the playwright. I see. You eventually drifted away then and began attending somewhere else? Yes, though I came back to this church now and again for as long as I remained on earth. We turned right at the next corner and proceeded west. The sun darted in and out between clouds as if trying to make up its mind whether or not to give in to the rain. One moment glistening, glittering, and the next obscure. Looking down at the sidewalk to watch Alexis' intricacies in avoiding the seams, I noticed with some surprise that he cast no shadow. Those are the end of chapter 20.